Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep, with the Madhu Indela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture, as well as the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And we have a very, 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 very special guest with us today, Dr. Modupe Oduyoye out of Nigeria, uh, a very well-known uh, linguist and theologian uh, of the Yoruba people. And we're going to have a, a detailed discussion about his work, uh, about the connections he's made between the uh, languages and the cultures of the Yoruba, the Hebrew, and the ancient Egyptians, and to see what other ideas he has been working on uh, throughout the years. So all of that and more when we return. Again, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, today again is a special, special day, and we want to make sure that um, everyone who is listening to this archive that y'all continue to uh, first and foremost, we appreciate you for your support uh, of the channel, and it is because of your love and support that we are able to do these types of interviews. And as I said before, um, our guest is Dr. Modupe Odioye, and I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Tunde Agdibola for uh, helping to set up this interview. Um, we are live. Uh, uh, Dr. Modupe uh, Odioye is uh, live in Nigeria right now. So, of course, we're here in the United States. And so um, the technology has allowed us to uh, connect and have this conversation. So it is a blessed thing. And so for any of you who are familiar with my work, you know that I like to quote uh, this professor. And unfortunately, I'm not in uh, my town of Philadelphia, PA right now. Uh, so I am in Texas, so I don't have all of my uh, books by the author, but I did bring two of mine uh, with me, and that is The Sons of the Gods and the Daughters of Men, an Afro-Asiatic Interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11, which you can see here, and you can see my book is kind of old, it's kind of falling apart, but, you know, uh, this is this is how much I, I read it, and uh, I brought with me to Texas, the uh, words and meaning in Yoruba religion, and it's subtitled uh, Linguistic Connections in the Yoruba, Ancient Egyptian, and Semitic. And so if you haven't gotten this text, and there are other texts that I have by him, including a, a, a very small text of, of poetry uh, by the author. And so it is, uh, I am overjoyed. And again, it is a, a big, big honor to, to have him uh, here today. And so without further ado, uh, I welcome Dr. Modupe Odioye. How are you doing, sir? Very well, very well, very well. <laughs> Very well, thanks to Dr. Adibola and his friend and his institute for looking after me when I was ill for about mm. uh, six months, but I'm on my feet again, yeah. Indeed, indeed. 
Um, well, first and yeah. foremost, uh, I, I just want to get a little background uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, who you are. So can you uh, tell us, you know, where you are from and what got you interested in, in doing the kind of research that you do? Right. Um, I am, my, my father is Yoruba, my mother is Yoruba, southwestern Nigeria. Mm. Um, I was born 1935. Mm. My father was a licensed surveyor and his work involved moving from pillar to post. He wouldn't leave any of his children behind, so I attended seven primary schools. Hmm. Part of this was in Josh, Northern Nigeria, around the age of five. There I picked up some Hausa and some Igbo. So by the time he came back home, within two years, he moved to his hometown, Ijebode, part of Yoruba land one of the 13 or so dialect groups of Yoruba land. When you speak of Yoruba language or any language in the world, it is usually good to know that the language has dialects and the dialects may be so varied that a young person may not be able to, from one area may not be able to understand the other. Now, this opportunity of going back home to Ijebu area, Ijebu de, gave me the opportunity of familiarizing myself with the Ijebu dialect. Mm -hmm. Now, Ijebu the town has, is surrounded by a moat, fortification trenches, dated at about 800 AD, hmm. acknowledged to be the largest moat in the world. Now, there must be something in that sort of community which found it necessary to protect itself. Necessity, one. Ability, two. The largest moat in the world. Moat. A moat was one of the uh, uh, methods by which you doubled the height of a city wall. If you build from ground level, you will get a height of a wall. If you want to double it and make things more difficult for the enemies, you dug down and heaped up the soil so that the enemy will first have to go down. In going down, he's at a disadvantage. You could throw things at him from the top of the moat hmm. and the top of the hill. The, top, the hill, the mound which you dug up is called Mound in Hebrew, it is T E L, Tel, hmm. like in Tel Aviv, a mound of flowers. Now, the consonant T L in Tel is the name of the town immediately after the moat I am speaking of, which is called Eredo. Hmm. The name of the town is Itele. Mm. So that on the other side of Italy, you have a redo. The consonants are RD. That is a consonant in Hebrew, red, go down. Yarad, he went down. Arabic, warada, he went down. Mm. It is a consonant in German, rad, root. Mm. So we are dealing with a worldwide thing. I passed the Yoruba, you know, it's good to start from somewhere. <laughs> and it's a lucky thing if one's life is preserved sufficiently that one doesn't end there. I first started seeing the connection between my own language, Yoruba and Hebrew. Within four or five years, I was telling myself, this is not just a Yoruba Hebrew matter. Gradually, 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 it's going to a world matter right now. 
Mm. It is a matter of where are all the languages of the world coming from? The, the, all the peoples of the world speak with identical speech organs. Two lips, one upper, one lower, <laughs> 32 teeth, 16 upper, 16 lower, one tongue, one throat, two nostrils. There is no language in the world spoken with any other instrument. And yet all these other languages have no more than about 35, 37 consonants. Now, you are going to have a big permutation and combination all over the world. And it is this permutation and combination which produces all the diversity. And we think that there are about 1,700 1, languages in the world. I am announcing to you that there is only one language in the whole world. <laughs> now, you haven't seen this one. I'm showing the cover of mm -hmm. the origins of Yoruba speech, mm -hmm. part one. And I'm display, I displayed at the back of it part of my universal language conversion chart, mm -hmm. which you can use to convert from one language of the world to another. Now, if you can look at it properly, you'll find I would say uh, two triangles on top. Uh -huh. Now, the bulge out on your side, trying to form a sort of cube. On the other side, you can extend them if you look on the other side. Meanwhile, you'll find the three principal consonantal families in the world. Hmm. D, G, B. D, G, B. The first one pronounced with the teeth, D. The second one with is a villa, G. The third one is with the two lips, B. They are all voiced. Now you go right down. If you go right down, you see the voiceless counterparts of D. It is T. Voiceless counterpart of G. It is K. Voiceless counterpart of B. It is P. Yoruba has no P. So we substitute P. In any case, with this, I can ask you to give me any English word you want, and I will show you with, the, with this chart the consonant that will show up in Yoruba or vice versa. Ditto. Okay. For all the languages I am familiar with, I'm very, very familiar with the languages of the world. Um, I would say from the Gulf of Aden to, <laughs> shall I say, New York City right now, okay. I'm penetrating gradually into the languages of the uh, 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 American Indians because that continent and this continent were used to, used to be one. They were Gondwana land. And mm. all of us used to be Pangaea. We spoke before the continents were pushed aside by forces on the ground. And some of the linguistic evidence is still there. O in Oklahoma is O, now, o, o in Omaha, the capital of, the Nebraska, of Nebraska, Big O is Omega in Greece. Now, mm -hmm. I've introduced sufficiently enough to stimulate you to ask questions. I'm ready to answer any question you want to answer. Uh, Meanwhile, I've gone further. I'm sorry. Go I'll ahead. show you how to get these new books. If you see the title, Babel of Tongues. Mm -hmm. Comparative Linguistics Beyond Indo Europe beyond Afro Asiatic and Indo European. You have to go beyond. All human beings emerged out of Africa. No part of the world was uh, 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 inhabited by human beings except Africa 600,000 years ago 
when we had the phenomenon we called out of Africa. They couldn't survive outside the tropics. The warmth of the tropical area allowed life to proliferate. It was from there that they took um, cautious steps into the cold countries. So mm. their ancestry in the tropical area is still with them till today. So here I am. I am at your service. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right. you you remind me of uh, I don't know how familiar you are with a scholar out of the Democratic, uh, well, not the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the Republic, uh, what's the other Congo? Republic Democratic. Uh, he's a he's a linguist. He's of of Songo and Zande ancestry, and he 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 wrote a book in French. Right. Uh, on the origins of African languages, uh, kind of expanding on right. Dr. Teofalo Binga's Negro Egyptian idea. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with a little bit mm -hmm. more rigor, he was able to demonstrate the relationship between uh, the African languages, which falls under what he calls Negro Egyptian, uh, after right. Teofalo Binga, and yep. Semitic and Indo-European. And he's right. now working on a book on the the African origins of of Semitic and Indo-European. And and he, right. and he dealt with a number of uh, uh of words and grammar in his previous book which came out in 2010. And so uh, mm -hmm. I can't wait for that book to come out and I can't wait to to read uh your book. Um but what I love right. about your work is that it, it reaffirms some independent work that I've done, um, mainly with ancient Egyptian and Bantu. And um, and I like to use Kikongo and Chiluba. So I'm American, you know, these aren't my native languages, but I have a lot of source material uh, and I've been able to, to answer certain questions. And I just love the way that you you write um, and the kinds of questions that you were answering. Uh, and so I, I'm assuming those are later than, than when these were published. Um, so before we get to the, the newer works, uh, I would like to ask you questions on um, some of the previous work that you've done. And okay. the, I know there's another book you have that I have as well on the Yoruba names. And um, I think you did one on right. Igbo names too, right? Uh, yeah, I published that, but I did not write it. Oh, okay. I published okay. it in my publishing house. I see. Uba Hakwe. Uba Hakwe is the author. Oh, okay, okay. I, I thought you were Igbo late. names. All right. And um, so I'll deal with, I think this came out later, but I'll, I'll do this one first. And this is the words and meaning in Yoruba religion, linguistic connections mm -hmm. between the Yoruba, ancient Egyptian and Semitic. And mm -hmm. you, you start off the text, um, speaking about folk etymology and and popular etymology and uh critiquing and analyzing the works of uh j olumide lucas and i know i'm pronouncing it not correctly lucas. i do apologize lucas. is the english name lucas lucas yes lucas yes but he's a yoruba man he was a yoruba man yeah Yes. And um, I, I would I would like for you to address, you know, this. This the, the inspiration behind this text and and why did you choose to. Uh, 
use your skills to to answer the kinds of questions that you did regarding the the folk etymology from whatever that conference that you attended uh which inspired the book yeah right um i know the, i can speak about the yoruba people mm -hmm. but since we did not invent the phrase folk etymology mm -hmm. that it is applied anywhere in the world applicable the folk the man in the street he has a word it sounds like somewhat he has heard before and he proceeds to try to say this word has origin its origin of this word is so so and so he explains it the way he can explain it that sort of explanation is usually called folk etymology. Plenty of it among the Yoruba people. Uh, for instance, the Yoruba people heard of the word German during the Second World War. German. Hey, what's this new word? So they said, it's Ijomano. Ijomano is Yoruba for five days. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, okay, yeah. The Ijomano people have, are coming again. And then you say, what has five days got to do with the ethnic name of some people? As you say, can't you see German, Germano? Okay. So later on now, somebody who knows German and the meaning of German and who knows Yoruba says, no, this is impossible. Hmm. German is the Germani <laughs> whom Caesar found in that part of Europe, Germani. So we have to look at Germani from that line, not from the German of the Yoruba people. Mm. Um, then the Yoruba is heard of the name of Namdi Azikiwe, an Igbo man near here, mm. near us here. Namdi Azikiwe, our first president. Oh, Azikiwe, Azikiwe, what's that? Well, you know, there is Iwe at the end of it. And Yoruba, Iwe means book. Oh. Uh, Dr. Azikwe had a degree from Harvard University and another one from Colombia, and he even taught there. And if you, if you listen to his speeches in Lagos, it's full of big words in English. Oh, that man is a tree of books. You know, Yoruba, Igi, and then Iwe, uh, Azikwe, Igi, Iwe. Oh, and then the cloud will clap and shout. <laughs> okay, folk etymology. Satisfied. Then somebody comes, ah, ah, you people have come again. Where did you find any Igi in this man's name? Why don't you go and ask him what his name means? <laughs> so that is folk etymology. It will go on forever. And it's uh, accepted by the populace. It gives them uh, Philip, the clap at popular gatherings. To right today, the many Yoruba people are saying, are explaining the meaning of why the, the Y H W H called mm -hmm. the tetramagon in a Hebrew, which we found written but not pronounced. Hmm. Now the Hebrews themselves or the non-Hebrews have tried to offer pronunciation. So even some say Jehovah, some say it is Yahweh. Okay, so the Yoruba say, well, you know. Um, um, it is a, 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 let me see what expansion they are giving to that one now. Hmm. Anyway, they'll produce their own word for Yahweh, Jehovah. Yeah. yeah. What he says will, uh, will stand. What he says will stand. That is why he is called Jehovah. Hmm. I, I listen and I laugh. Long time ago, I told, uh, uh, the professor who taught me Hebrew in Yale, I said, you know, I'm looking at this YHWH, and in Psalm 29, it says that Yahweh breaks the cedars of Lebanon. And then it says, the voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars. Then in verse 3b, it says, Yahweh 
is the god of thunder. I said, oh, if it is the god of thunder, then why H-W-H is Latin J-O-V-E, Jove, the Roman god of thunder. Hmm. I discovered that before I discovered any connection between Yahweh and Yoruba. So this is not hmm. a Yoruba matter. I announced to him, and he said, ah, hmm? I, I doubt if this is true. If it is true, it is, it is, what did they say? Volcano. But I don't think it is true. So you know what I told myself? I said one of the tasks of a pupil is to convince his master. <laughs> right now, if you look at the top of the book, the, so I dedicated my book to him. <laughs> And mm -hmm. then the publisher sent it to him. If you want to see his opinion, just turn to the back of uh, the sons of the gods and the daughters of men and see whether he has now been convinced that YHWH is Latin J O V E, thunder. Mm -hmm. Now, then, then some people say, Are you suggesting that Jehovah is thunder? Isn't it? Uh, uh, but the Hebrews didn't worship gods of nature. I mm. said, were they deaf? Uh, were the Hebrews deaf? And they mm. couldn't hear lightning? No, they couldn't hear thunder. Were they blind and they couldn't see lightning? Is there anybody anywhere in the world where people don't shiver when thunder strikes? Now, the Yoruba says, if you don't believe in the god of lightning, I'll mention the name later. <laughs> it says, lightning has not struck near your feet. If lightning has ever struck near your feet, you will never, never play with the God of lightning. <laughs> that is a God we all are confronting. And if anybody says we worship the God of lightning, I say fear. If you fear anybody, that is what is called worship. <laughs> yeah. To wash him, say, ah, this is great. Lightning. I read somewhere that lightning spark is one, the greatest force, the greatest source of power in the, in the solar system. Hmm. Nothing can stand before it. Yeah. So, uh, now, later on now, this God is called, I would draw my word, God. Hello? Um, it seems that he is frozen at the moment. Uh, if you can hear me, Dr. Odioye, your, uh, your screen is frozen. And let me see. Let me type uh, the screen is frozen. And until we get this situation straightened, um, he'll be coming back in. You know, you should know that, you know, volcanoes, and this is something that I've, I've mentioned before in my work in terms of Yahweh that he is a volcano god. But what a lot of people don't realize is that volcanoes, because of the chemical composition of when a, a volcano explodes, you'll see lightning and thunder over the mountain of an erupted volcano. And and so it is, it is very, very plausible. Um, looks like we got him back in. Right. Okay, yeah. there you go. Around that So you begin to take universal phenomena mm -hmm. uh, and see how people all over the world respond to this universal phenomena hmm. and how they express or report back home their experiences using two lips, <laughs> and two teeth, one tongue. Two nostrils, one throat, no other instrument. <laughs> so 
they go further and tell us that Yahweh is a God, a jealous God. In Hebrew, El Kane. Mm. Now, the Kane, Q N, is G N in Indo European. So you get the Hindu god of fire, Agni. Mm -hmm. Then you get the Yoruba god, Yoruba archetype of blacksmiths who use fire, Ogun, mm -hmm. to create. Then you get Hebrew, QN, for the one of the two sexes that creates a child, the woman. And Eve gave birth to her first child and said, Kaniti each, I have created a human being. All feminists all over the world should take note of that. A big boast. <laughs> <laughs> Eve said, I have created a human, a, a human, a man. And then he went on to say, et YHWH. I said, look at what this woman is saying. You created Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> so the QN you now get in uh, Greek G N Gune mm -hmm. woman from where we got gyne gynecology mm. monogyny so fire so you begin to trace the origin of how human beings manage to stop being af be too afraid of fire. Animals are still afraid of fire today. But human beings at one time, I, I think it, the, there will be mythology all over the world. Who was the first to tame fire? They said, he stole it from the gods. Mm -hmm. I am going to guess. I think that is Deucalion among the yeah. Greeks. But all over the world, we stole fire from the gods. Now, the gods are going to have it back on us. <laughs> so the Ogu people in Yoruba land, they sacrifice human beings. And mm. the modern uh, other people say, look at these people. They are sacrificing human beings to God. That is terrible. <laughs> but they have what they call N-Jin. Look at that, N-Jin. N genes. And part of their engines are aircraft. And an aircraft crashes and 350 people die in one single day. They don't accuse themselves of sacrificing three people, 350 people to the Yoruba god of uh, 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 blacksmiths. Can you see that? We pardon them. But when we see when in the when they found the Yoruba people sac what they are saying is that you cannot have engineering without sacrificing human beings. Go and check it. Hmm. Plus, and all that. Hmm. Hmm. Now, hmm. So we have to we have to universally to get ready for these things. If you are not ready to pay the cost, the cost is called the sacrifice. If you are hmm. not prepared to pay the cost, then get away from it. When we have Chernobyl. Chernobyl in Russia. Even the Russians themselves couldn't deal with it. I think they came to the United States. Hmm. Political fight or no fight. And they got uh, an American surgeon, if it was, to do bone marrow transfer. Hmm. And some countries scaled down their nuclear energy something. But some people don't know that you can you have to scale down because what came out of Chernobyl was not visible. <laughs> that is what is called spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the New Testament, we have these people, the Sadducees, who do not believe in spirits or in angels or in resurrection among the Jews. So there are some people today who do not believe in spirits. I said, well, when you're Chernobyl, leaks you will believe in spirits <laughs> somebody says he doesn't believe in spirit in this year of uh, uh what is it called covid mm. yes Can, uh, have they touched the virus 
like Thomas, who said, oh, except I see and touch, I will not believe. Okay, let them not believe. <laughs> they will believe on the other side of eternity. <laughs> yes. Lukun, who I call it, Lukun, I call uh, 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 this COVID Luku, Luku. Mm. The LK I got from LK in Greek, Lukos, wolf. This mm. is a wolf prowling in the night. And mm. it is a virus that affects poultry keepers here. He wakes up in the morning and sees 100 of his poultry dead. Ah, who done it? He can't see them. The evil man has come in the night. Hmm. It is as if wolves came in the night to eat them up and run away. So the Greek has Lukos, wolf. We have LK, LK, Luku, Luku, virus. Hmm. That is what. And how do we deal with this virus? Luku, Luku, you. Uh, you give human beings a little tinge of it so that they get familiar with it and they can survive the bigger one. So with the LK, LK, you introduce another LK, Greek, Leucos, white. Hmm. The Yoruba call the white bird, Leke, Leke. <laughs> that is the cattle bread, all white. He said, the black one killed them. Let us introduce the white one. It will cure it. So yeah. when we were young and we see a, an egret flying in the sky, we put up, we, we, we wave our hands like this and say, leke, leke, bamile, ke, eya, dabak, bamile, ke, o, leke, leke, bamile, ke, eya, dabak, bamile, ke, o. And we go and show, uh, uh, show our friends our nails. I said, look, I have got the white mark from leke, leke. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Adibola is here to tell me whether we are kidding ourselves, illusion, or whether it really happens. So, <laughs> all these phenomena are existing among human beings universally. Let us study, let us begin from our ethnic group to study universal phenomena. Mm. Yes, that's where I am now. All righty. Yeah. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, you you hit on i want to i want to shift to a, a discussion that you have in the mm -hmm. uh the sons of the gods and the daughters of men text and that is on the fulani and that the the word fulani is, is cognate with the word Hebrew and that ultimately the Hebrews and the Fulani have the same ancestry and that the Fulani yeah. have been moving between North Africa and Arabia for thousands of years. Um, yeah. How did you come to that conclusion and and right. what, what was your insights on on that on that story good now there is a map on page 65 of that book please can you open it 65 yeah. i think you, there's a map there uh, hold on uh, the ultimate it, origins oh. of the full name. yes is it page 65 yes you found it mm -hmm. Okay, you see that the arrow actually begins in India. Mm. Am I right? Yes. Hello? Yes. The arrows begin in India. Okay. Now, there are two major types of cows in the world. The cows with long horns and the cows with short horns. The Fulani are associated with only one of them. Now, these cows, the scientists call the ones with the long horns, Bos Indicus. 
Can you get me? Uh -huh. Those indicus. What the scientists mean is that whenever you find this type of cows, they ultimately came from where? India. They, these are the same type of cows which have humps at their back. Hmm. The other type of cow they call Bos taurus. Latin, taurus, cow. Fre uh, Spaniard, toro, France, I mean, cow. Yoruba, atori, whip, cowhide. Latin, taurea, ca uh, bullhide. So, the cow with the hunchback, hunchback is storing oil and fat there because it is the type of cow that wanders around dry season areas of the world. The other type of cow doesn't have reserve of fat. It doesn't wander around. Even from ancient times before human beings domesticated these two types. So we have indicated the origin of the uh, 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 bush indicus. They are they are found with the Fulani people in West Africa. So I suggest that the association of the Fulani with the long horned humped back cattle goes back to the origins of those cows themselves. Mm. If that is India, then the origins of the Fulani are in India. All right. Now we look at the name. In Genesis, human beings, the children of Adam, two of them, Adam, Habel. Habel has three consonants, H, B, L. This is characteristics of all the languages of the world. The words in these languages are cons constituted out of three consonants which I call the root. These three consonants have a base of two consonants, only two. Between H, B, L, the weakest of the three is H. You are left with B, L. For the second son of Adam, we are told that he was a keeper of sheep. The elder one, Cain, was a tiller of the ground. Now, this one, the one, the tiller of the ground, Cain, killed Habel. Why? Hmm. The cattle of Habel trampled on the farm products of Cain, who had iron instruments. He got angry, brother or no brother, and hit Abel, and Abel died. So the BL in Abel, the B is bilabial voiced, the voiceless version is P. So you have PL left. In West Africa, the Fulani are called P-E-U-L, pure, in the French-speaking countries. In the English-speaking countries, the P shows uh, labiodental, so we call them fula. They themselves call themselves with two consonants, F-L, full B. The B being plural. Mm -hmm. Like you have in Basuto, Baluba, Bakongo, full B. They put their own B at the very end. Their language they call full, full D. The D E, the D, in D E being Yoruba, a D. The language of the full, full. In the Middle East, in pre-biblical and biblical times, 
the PR, PL showed PR, R being a variant of L and N, three link vowels, consonants, which you can find opposite page one of the origins of Yoruba speech, L and R. So for full, you get a PR. Hmm. Pro, PR, pray, spread, increase, multiply, propagate. So the uh, apiro scattered all over the Middle East, they were nomadic. The P can show V in Ivri, Ivri. And Ivri is a passerby. It doesn't stop in one place. Now, the BR you find among the Fulani in West in Nigeria till today, those of them who have not yet settled. They're called the Bororo, Bororo BR with the R duplicated, partial reduplication. So I said, look, this is the same phenomenon. Now, what, this phenomenon must be studied worldwide because we have to live with it. What is it we have to live with? We have to live with nomads. Mm -hmm. You see, when we all stopped being hunter-gatherers, some decided to settle, plant. Some decided not to settle. These two groups cannot understand each other. They were cannot, we, the farmers, cannot understand how some people will refuse to settle down, live under roofs, sleep in the open air in the 20th or 21st century, and they don't die. Okay, but there is a conflict. The planters settled where things were green, rain, uh, water, Assured, two parts of the Middle East, the Nile and the and Mesopotamia between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. These two places were assured of water and therefore they solved the problem of food very early. Now, the ones who are carrying their cattle around and looking for green pastures always attack. Yeah, I'm glad to see what you are showing me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. They, they always attack green fields, grasslands, grasslands. So they attacked Egypt, they attacked Canaan. Now, Canaan, what characterized Canaan? A land flowing with milk and Honey, there is no such land in the world that has not been attacked by nomads. There will be no such land in the world in the future that will not be attacked by nomads. <laughs> Let's get ready for that. If we know what to do about it and there's going to be no fight, okay. It will be called xenophilia. But the world is full of xenophobia. The Hebrews migrated into Egypt because there was famine in Canaan. There was food in Egypt. But the Egyptians considered it an abomination to sit down to eat with shepherds. Now, if you take all the such statements, you will not know that the Egyptians had their own type of cows. Because later on, um, the Pharaoh asked Joseph, a nomad, to ask his own people if there are some of them who could help look after his own cow. Hmm. Now, what this means is that 
there are no people in the world who do not have specialist functions, which can be utilized by those who know how to use foreigners. Some people, the only thing they know about foreigners is to keep them out. They don't know how to exploit and invite them and domesticate and own. It's like not allowing Einstein to enter the United States. <laughs> are you, please, are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Emigras. M G R. M G R. Migrants. Their function from antiquity until tomorrow. Their function is because they were emigrants. They passed through various cultures in their migrations. And wherever they get to, the, the people who are sedentary, they're afflicted with some dis dis disease or some needs. And these migrants say, when we were passing through such and such a land, we saw this type of phenomena, and this is how they treated it. Can we try? Some people say, get away from here. Some people, then, then a maid, a maid will say, okay, master, let us listen to these people. Let us give them a trial. That is how the, that general from the land of, I remember now, who did not want to go and bath in the pool of Siloam because he said he had bigger rivers in his own country. And then a small girl said, Master, give them a try. And he went and came back whole. <laughs> These people, migrants, the blacks, the blacks brought into Nova Scotia, hmm. cutting into people's flesh and rubbing it with the with a, a smallpox, and they were not dying in their community. That is the origin of vaccination. All the American Indians, Amer Indians, who civilized people pushed aside, they better go to them and study their culture, how they survived in that land before younger brother came. Because the Native Americans, when the uh, Europeans came, they welcomed them as younger brothers. And they saw them behaving like youths, youths, <laughs> wanting to destroy all the ancient things. And one of them, I've forgotten what chief, said, when you people have cut down all the trees, you will see what you are left with. We didn't cut down the redwood forests. We left them there because we know what we are doing. <laughs> so you brought your chainsaw and you started cutting them down. And now you are complaining about Katharina and bushfires. <laughs> Look at that every year so that's where we must study human history before the continents broke apart hmm. before the brazil curve broke away from the west african curve hmm. in such a way that the sheep sheep s-h-e-e-p that animal in West Africa, there is a version of it in Argentina. It is called Lama. L L A M A. The French, the Spanish pronunciation will be Yama. But look at this word L M A, Lama. You are taught in geography in school that that is the sheep of the Pampas. Now, what is Pampa itself? The Yoruba have the word Akpapa. Mm. Akpapa is grassland. Mm. So the Pampas are the Akpapa of Argentina. And when the split came in the continent, some broke off on the other side and continued to be called Lama, and their habitat continued to be called Pampas. And on this side, we had LHM, Arabic Lachmu, meat. Hebrew, Lehem Lachmu, bread, something you chew. The L shows N in Hausa Nama, 
meat in chui in ghana nam fish something you chew in yoruba ar ero animal in shona chiromo mouth meat with which you chew so who says globalization is a 20th century phenomenon no 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 there is nothing new under the sun <laughs> indeed and um yeah, yeah it's, it's so much uh works and you know so many things that we can touch on but i mm. want to ask you know has there has there been any ideas that you wrote in your earlier works that you may have changed your mind on um concerning anything that you know uh later on today like revisiting wanna... some of your other works pardon um are there any ideas that that you had in some of your earlier works that you may have changed your mind on later or you got more details and Good. it got reaffirmed in in later works um because i don't think we have those we don't have access right. to those other works in the united states so i think this is the light the latest book that we can find here uh in 1996. what is that one <laughs> That's the uh, Yoruba religion title. Uh, words and meaning in the Yoruba religion. Okay, I, 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 if you look at the appendix, at the end of it, mm -hmm. it was additional, required yeah. by Kanak House when they were going to publish the vocabulary of Yoruba religious discourse. Hmm. Uh, because there had been a gap of some years, um, the director of Karnak, Shaba Sakana, asked me to update it. So I gave that update. All right. Uh, I feel lucky that I do not, you know, when I publish any of my findings, you can almost be sure that. There are 10 years of notes and notes and notes in my house. Hmm. I've been lucky that what I needed or I've needed to withdraw and rescind, I offer to say right now, none, none, none. Hmm. Because I proceed cautiously. Uh. And when I find that I have got it all tight, I speak it out and stick out my neck for the guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a matter of, I first discovered Yoruba and Hebrew. Huh? Uh -huh. I could have ended that way. What did, what did he, my, my first Hebrew lesson say? He says, Semitic words in Semitic languages are built on three consonants, e.g. Arabic kitab. <laughs> book, Kativ, writer, Hebrew, Kituvim, the writings. So, okay, I went on Semitic languages, Semitic languages. Ah, then gradually I said, what am I looking at? K-T-B, Kitab, writing. And this writing is the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall. I said in my village when we make palm oil, the dreg, you plaster yeah. on the wall for it to dry. And we want to use it to kindle fire. We call it ko to ko. I said, we don't, I said this KTB is our KTP. It is yeah. embossed writing. There is the other type of writing, 
engraven, two types of writing, embossed, you raise, engrave, you dig down. Hmm. So I said, and we paste it on a wall for the passerby to see. That is the writing on the wall. <laughs> so I said, who says we didn't know how to write? Who didn't say we are not used to public uh, announcement? Okay. The Ten Commandments were written on what in Hebrew are called luach, luach, tablets, luach abanim, tablets of stone, tablets of stone, like the Rosetta Stone. Come to any Yoruba home in this town where I'm living and in my own house, you will see a luach abanim, like the Rosetta Stone. Do you know what I use it for? I use it for grinding pepper. <laughs> grinding pepper. So we had Luak Abanim. Now, did we write with it? Yes, yes, yes. Engraving. It is a hard material. So our pen was not a was not a, a feather. It was hard material, stylus. We called it gege. Ge is to cut. Gege is the instrument to cut. So we say, what one a man of authority says, we says the blade cuts it. What mm. he says, abe ge. What is that abe which cuts what the man says? How do you cut what another man says? When the king says something, the scribe having a tablet of stone in front of him and a, and a stylus of steel gege, begin to engrave on it because they are going to display it in public as a public notice hmm. abe ge, we had that before but we did not have universal literacy hmm. we were specialists and the specialists, the, the, the people in the community couldn't even read it. You know, the Egyptians forgot how to read hieroglyphics. <laughs> you are aware of that? Yes. And it took a, a crypto, it took a cryptologist, if I may call it that way, to <laughs> decipher it. He was not even a, an Egyptian. This is Champollion. And he was not a linguist. He was an architect. But he said this, this is a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> so, uh, we, do you know where writing began in the world? In the areas of the world where they had solved the food problem and could afford the luxury of writing. <laughs> I'll say it again. In the two areas of the world where having solved the food problem, Egypt, Mesopotamia, then the Mesopotamia could start scratching on clay, cuneiform, and the Egyptians could start uh, these beautiful things you saw. We don't eat, nowhere in the world do people eat art. <laughs> when they are satisfied and they are not afraid of, their, of food, okay, they spend their spare time on art. Writing is an art. Art in Latin has two consonants, R, S. The S becomes T. If you look at this chart, you'll find T and S on the first vertical line together. R and S, R, R, T, S. Hmm. Originally, anywhere in the world, artists were the people who wrote. In uh, Hebrew, you find H R Sh Harash Harash. The Harash was the artisan. His material could be wood, wood cover. Harash etsim. It could be bronze. 
harassed Barzell. Mm. These were the people who, with their inscribing, engraving, aha, mm. their art is pres prescribed today in many much in many graves worldwide in memory of what used to happen. You find gravestones engraving the old ancient way on hard material marble that was ancient writing. G-R-F-Grapho in Greek, G-R-V, grave in English, and grave in Yoruba, the, in Hebrew, Q B R Keber Grave. The Q B Maj in Yoruba to find to find you Labio Villa B, which is common in the West African languages, the pronunciation, but the ability to pronounce it like that, non-existent in many other areas of the world. So we say bere. Now we see bere. We make bodily incisions and we have uh, for the grave, we say to the, uh, the dead person, Odibere, until the grave. Mm. So these are the ancient origins of writing. The man who said Africa has no history, history exists where people take to writing. I can find no writing in Africa, south of the Sahara. Therefore, south of the Sahara, there was no history. Very, very ignorant man. Because all he was saying is that I cannot read the hieroglyphics. That's all. Yeah. So I stopped there. Meanwhile, he couldn't read the hieroglyphics and he went back home to say he saw no writing. Yeah. So alphabet is the, is the, was the original writing. Who taught Greece to write? Yeah. The Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were Canaanites, coastal Canaanites, who formed a colony in the country of Hannibal. Mm -hmm. That's Tunis, the country of St. Augustine who wrote the best Latin of his own time. Hannibal had an ambition to conquer Rome. And he was already going with an army using a beast of burden, elephants, just because there are no elephants in the Sahara today. Within the history of the Sahara began when, the anim when all the elephants had vanished. No, we have to go back to the history of the Sahara before desiccation, before desiccation. Okay. And when desiccation began and people ran in four directions looking for water, some went east and stopped when they saw this water flowing okay. northwards northwards and so the europeans were surprised how can a river flow northwards all okay. our Euro rivers flow southwards into the mediterranean this one is flowing northwards and this is like the, it's a land of mystery <laughs> so the arabs call it msr Mishr. the hebrews call it mitzrayim Aim being two the lands of mystery Oh, they found a lot of mystery in Egypt. The Egyptians called that river Iteru. Iteru. That got into the Hebrew Bible in two forms. One, Yor. Yor. Mm. Two, Yitro. The priest of Midian, mm. a priest and a doctor. From Yitro, we got 
Greek iatros, physician. And then we got Greek hiereus, priest. So all that passed into Greece, Greek passed it into Europe. Europe did not know that Greek got it from Egypt. And we say, whom do we say is the father of medicine? <laughs> Hippocrates. That was medicine in Egypt before Hippocrates. The oldest university in the world is Alhaza, 900 and something AD. Nine, Alhaza. Mm -hmm. We let us not betray our ignorance anywhere in the world by not studying origins. Mm -hmm. Origins in Egypt, origins in Mesopotamia, from Sumeria. Mm -hmm. The father of Abraham, his name was Nahor. N H R. Hebrew Nahar is a river. Every river is a migrant. I want to repeat that one million times. Mm -hmm. The first migrants in the world were rivers. Rivers migrate from their source to the sea. <laughs> yes. So we have that man called Nahor. <laughs> and he migrated from Ur. Ur in German is ancient, Urzeit. And he migrated from Ur, you know, creating the first waterways in the world. The first roads in the world were created by rivers. Every river is a waterway. And waterways are always older than highways. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. The Ganga, whom the Europeans call Genghis, Ganga, mm -hmm. the longest river in uh, India, I hope. G -m -g. Every flowing river is a healer in contrast with stagnant water. I repeat, every flowing river or stream is a healer. It renews itself. If it is a, a rumpled, you just wait 10 hours. It is renewed by fresh water and you can, it is clear again. So it is recommended that you can jump in and wash off the filth on your body. And you can even take some of it and drink and cleanse your inside. So G N G in Ganga in India got to Bantu Africa as G N G Nganga Healer <laughs> Nganga. Now for the first G, which is voiced, substitute voiceless K, and you get Congo. So Ganga for Ganges is Congo in Africa, and uh, the kings in uh, uh, the kings in the African section, the king healers are Bakongo. Then you now get to Europe and they say KNG, Konig in German, King in English. Because in ancient times you had king priests like Melchizedek. So English, King. Congo, Ganga, Nganga. All of them ancient cognates. Yeah. So <laughs> somebody now comes to Africa and sees the Nganga and call him witch doctor. Can you listen? Witch doctor. But <laughs> when he goes back home, he doesn't call his own king a witch. <laughs> Can you get me? Ignorance. Yeah. Now. Please, I'm very sorry that from the time of 1948, when we had a university in Ghana, Legon, 
another one in Ibadan, University College Ibadan. 48, till today, hieroglyphics and Egyptology it has never been taught in these two places. Can you get me? Mm -hmm. These are the people driving Sheikh and Tadiop crazy. <laughs> you know Sheikh and Tadiop? Yes, I do. These are the people till tomorrow. Swahili has never been taught in the University College of Badon. Mm. Can you get me? Yes. Who's going to slap them on the face? <laughs> Who's going to slap them on the face? Institute of African Studies, 1960. Grant from Ford Foundation. From 1960 till today, Swahili is not taught in University College of Badon. I'm the first to teach any Nigerian language in any Nigerian university. Hmm. Now, please, can you cross the PhD against after my name? Please. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Please, that PhD out of it. Hmm. It does not exist. Hmm. Are you getting me? Yes. No, I'm, tell I'm, I'm telling you the truth. When I was coming this morning, I was the gate man, gate man, where I live, Bodija Estate, Ibado. Mm -hmm. We are all professors here. I'm not joking, no. Mm -hmm. I, I am living in a part of Africa designated by the Action Group Government Educational Zone. Okay. Almost 35 kilometers of it. Some bomb intellectually is going to arise from this area. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. If we stop being silly, <laughs> like saying that nobody who has a PhD can teach in an Nigerian university. <laughs> what are you saying that I cannot teach in an Nigerian university? I read my case. I see. Nonsense. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. Yes, we cannot teach in a Nigerian university, but intellectual work will bypass the universities, as mm -hmm. it has frequently done. Are you getting me? Yes, I am. Again, we started flying in the air, not because, not thanks to the universities. Mm -hmm. Was the locomotive thanks to the universities? Oh, if the, any university in the world which is not humble enough to know that it does not have a monopoly of observation, are you listening to me? Yeah, so outside universities, people go around the world with uh, their eyes blindfolded. No, 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 in the Cameroons, where they have earthquakes now and then. They see more about seismology than in any seismological uh, institute in any university in this world. They see lava flowing down. And a young man ran home to say, I saw a big snake entering our farm. <laughs> and the elder says, the elders laughed at this young man who saw lava from the type of Mount Cameroons flowing into their uh, farm. The following morning they came and the lava had solidified and they saw a hill, formation of mountains among people who had never been in universities. <laughs> yes, yes. We are all opening our eyes. Let the people in the university go and do their field work. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that brings me, um, that brings me to my next question of, you know, how do we reconcile? Or I should I should ask. Going back to. The. The biblical text. And you use your native language. To as a basis for reinterpreting 
ancient Hebrew uh, scriptures. Yep. And so, like, how important is African languages, especially West African languages and culture, to the proper interpretation of the biblical text? All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Put it this way. The word in the Hebrew Bible for uh, the first thing created in the image of God is mm -hmm. has a consonant DM. Adam. Are you getting me? Mm -hmm. Adam. DM. As far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, what is this image of God? Hmm. He was already standing on two legs. <laughs> <laughs> the Adam, the image of God in the Hebrew scriptures was already standing on two legs. Hmm. Now you come to Africa and he says, you know, we used to go on four legs. Mm -hmm. We didn't drop, the, we, we, were, we, we were using this DM before we began to stand on two legs. DM in Africa, in, in English, write down Adam and write at the end of it, A-N-T, A-N-T. You get what? Adamant. Hmm. So Africa tells you, Go around the world, anything you see that is adamant, that is the image of God. Hmm. You go around. Then you get to Ethiopia. <laughs> and you find DM, Damo, D A M O, Damo. You say, What's that? They say, Python. Are, are you getting me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a python is in the a python is adamant if you don't believe it go near it <laughs> and it will wind itself around you i hope it's a python not the other one which we call boa constrictor without teeth without biting you it will twist itself around you and it will stretch you dead that is, then it will tell you that is the image of what we call God. We so say we have, a, then the Igbo people will say, Oh, we have our own DM before we were standing on two legs. We say, What is that? We say, We call it Odum. O D U M. Odum. We say, What is that? We say, Lion. Huh? You say, a lion is in the image of God. He's adamant. What do you mean by adamant? He will not shrink from your uh, eye contact. Some other animals, you may scare them off. Not a lion. <laughs> adamant. Then you get to Ghana, and they say, our own DM is that tree, the tallest tree in West Africa whose timber is the hardest. Uh, you, euphoria excelsis, that's the scientific name. Hmm. Its timber, if you strike it with your machete, instead of the timber getting indented, it is your iron machete that will bend. They say, they are, this one is adamant. So they call the, that tree odum. Now, the Yorubas call that tree with a name which has RK, Iroko. That RK is what you have in English, rock. Hmm. A tree that is as adamant as a rock. Now, they say this is our, our ancestry in Africa goes beyond the four-legged one, the two-legged Adam. It goes up to these four-legged ones. Therefore, when we give ourselves our full name, 
it has three components in OYO. Something like Adeyemi, Alabi, Opo. Opo is a staff, a rock. You know what's got connection with? Why, why, why are you connecting your family uh, line with a rock? Another one, Adeyemi, Alamuiri. Any is the elephant. R N R N in Yoruba any is R N in English iron. Hmm. An elephant is as tough as iron. So you come back to before we were walking on two legs. All right. You now say, you now ask, who is the son of God? It seems Christianity is interested in that question. Mm -hmm. Who is the son of God? Three or four gospels. Two of them has genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew and Luke. Matthew began from Jesus. No, maybe from Adam to Jesus. Luke began ending from Jesus to Adam. And he was saying some Luke in particular. And Luke says, I have studied all what my previous the previous people who wrote their gospel said, and I have now stating my considered opinion. He was a physician. Shall I say a researcher? <laughs> and he went on. Enosh, the son of Adam. Adam, the son of God. Can you listen to that again? Enosh, the son of Adam. Adam, the son of God. Eh? When I saw it in Luke 3 38, I began to test my Christian friends. <laughs> I would I would say open Luke 3 38. I say, focus your eye on it. Don't allow any distraction. Because I'm going to ask you a question. And then I say, are you looking at it? You say, yes. Are you sure you're looking at it? Yes. Then I say, who is the son of God? You will say, Jesus. I say, is that what you find in what is in front of you? He'll look at it again. I say, are you looking at it? He said, yes. Who is the son of God? He said, Jesus. I said, what's happening? <laughs> Did you do something in primary school called silent reading? Did you do something in secondary school called comprehension? Did you pass school certificate comprehension? Look at the text again. He look at it. I say, are you concentrating? He said, yes. Who is the son of God? He'll begin to quibble. That is... The doctrine that Jesus is the Son of God is not found in that text. And he's afraid to allow the truth of what he's finding to, utter, to come out of his mouth. And there's a lot of Christian theology and fighting going on about that, refusing to acknowledge that Adam is the Son of God, made in the image of whom? And that the Python is the image of God, and that the lion is the image of God, and that the Iroko tree is the image of God, and that anything adamant is the image of God. Two are better than one. If one cannot withstand an enemy, two of them working together can withstand him. So you have this DM. Don't stand alone. Combine into an assembly. Mm. The DM Greek use it in demos. OS for nominative DM. Democracy. Democracy being power of the DM. Power of DM. Democracy. And it went on and went on and went on until the Russia. When one of these czars 
was going to give his people a representative assembly. He called it Duma, mm -hmm. D-U-M-A. When they come together, it's partly the Duma, which eventually contributed to the overthrow of the Tsars. That's the power of DM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we now use it to face the text in a, our biblical text and say, we can go to what Africa used to call totems. Totems. you find totems in Haiti, Tahiti, and in all those parts of the world where the black people spread to. But I don't know whether uh, Europeans now understand what is the meaning of a totem. The Native Americans have totems. The Africans have totems. That is what our ancestors used to be even before we stood on two legs. These are part of the contribution which I know can be made. I happen to be a member of the a joint committee of the World Council of Churches and the Vatican in Rome about the contribution of people of black Africa to the religious heritage of mankind. We have to show the heritage, what the world, all the religions of the world owe to ancient Africa. Let us not boast about it. It is mm -hmm. tropics that give us the privilege. I repeat, we are tropical mm -hmm. people. That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed. Well, um, I know we're winding down and I want you uh, to to speak on your other uh, books. Um, I know you showed two of them. Are there any that you're currently working on uh, books that hasn't been published yet? Not at all. Well, um, I mentioned. Let me mention three. Okay. Well, already available in the computer, can be downloaded for people who, prefer, who don't mind having their own copies that way until it is uh, available in book form. Mm -hmm. One. Logistics, ballistics, and linguistics. Logistics, ballistics, and linguistics. That's the title of one. Right. Another one. Semantic analogy and the trajectories of the human mind. That's another one. The Babel of Tongues. You said the Babel of Tongues? Babel of Tongues, that's this one. Already available in Nigeria in book form. Mm -hmm. But can be downloaded. The address will be supplied. All right. Babel of Tongues. Comparative linguistics beyond Afro-Asiatic and Indo-European. And then the origins of your speech, but one, where for the first time I revealed this chart, which will be explained later in a pamphlet, hmm. the universal language conversion chart. Now, all these are already again. 2005 materials. So what has happened between 2005 and now? Okay, I'll mention okay. this title. Lightning, thunder, and rain. Hmm. I'm studying those phenomena worldwide. Four of the Scandinavians. That's the own god of lightning. 
Jove of the Romans, Shoggo of the Yoruba, which is sang in the Cameroons for pure, holy, sanctum, sanction. I give you the word sanction, hold the word sanction in your hand. All human communities need sanction for their laws. A law that has no sanction, people will break it. They'll say, who's going to catch me? So everywhere in the world, they create somebody, something, some principle would they say, he will catch you. They make him very speedy. You cannot run away from him. They make him very strong. And in many parts of the world, they found in nature, lightning has that characteristics, physical characteristics. Yeah. So I'm studying lightning, their words and their concept for lightning all over the world. It's association with thunder and the inevitable consequence, rain. From Greek, uh, Hebrew, barah, lightning. To Greek, brocade, rain. English, brook, water dropping from heaven. Hebrew, breka, a pool. And then the co concept of showers of blessing. Because without water, there can be no life. And it is lightning which produces, which ends in rain and blessing. So there's no blessing anywhere in the world where they do not understand lightning, thunder, and rain. And they need to understand the language. If you read Psalm 19, 1, Hashamayim Musapurim Kavod El. The heavens are broadcasting the thunder of God. You have to understand that language. Lightning is a speech of God. <laughs> the speech of God is audiovisual. What if I speak to a, dead, a deaf man and he doesn't understand? Lightning. What if I speak to a blind man and he doesn't understand? Thunder. So audiovisual. <laughs> and we have to follow suit. So what is God saying when it's th lightnings and thunders? God says, I've done my own bit of the contract for you to have all your, your food anywhere in the world. Go and pick up your horse. I'm not going to pick up the hoe. And I'm not going to put the seed on the ground. That's your business. If you like, let the water flow away into the sea. It will become salt and you won't be able to drink it. If you like, collect it. <laughs> So, <laughs> can you get that? Yeah. We must not behave like this, as if God has condemned us to learn the technique of the Romans, to go and bring water far away into Rome in aqueducts. What about collecting straight away before it sinks into the ground in what the Yorubas call or shore rock? Sh R, which you find in English, Usher, U S. H E R S H R. Usher all this water into a shore. Does God create a river without a shore? If God does not provide a shore, the whole world will be flooded. So we too should provide ourselves with a shore. We used to have it here, and then all these modern architects are designing houses for us without providing this usher. Every roof is a water collector. Mm -hmm. And we're now depending on boreholes in the ground. And we have to pump it up again with electric power, which we have to pay for. Stupid modern people. Modernism can be stupid. Modernism is full of what I call rigmarole. Solving the problem with a formula more complicated than the problem itself. <laughs> so lightning, 
thunder and rain. In Macbeth, the white sisters, when shall we three meet again? In lightning, in thunder, and in rain. Thank you. <laughs> well, I can't wait for those uh, texts uh, or for that text to, uh, to come forth. And um, I look forward to reading your, your other texts as well. And I'm pretty sure that um, it will, uh, you know, enhance my uh, studies. Matter of fact, I'm working on a text right now titled uh, Chiluba, uh, uh, the language of the Baluba people in, in Central Africa, uh, their name of God, Mawedia, or Mawedia, uh, Yoruba Orisha, and Ancient Egyptian Ak. That's, that's how they, Egyptology speaks. And it's subtitled An Exploratory Etymological Study. Right. And uh, I, I build off of, there's aspects of the text where I build off of your uh, analysis of Orisha in this text uh, here. Uh -huh. And it was actually, uh, there was two other works. Um, it looks like he uh, went out, but he'll come back in. But there is two other works that um helped influence and helped me solve this problem as well that are mentioned and cited in the text but uh hopefully we can get the professor back on but in the meantime y'all can Yes, uh, we have the professor back with us. And uh, I was just sending an advertisement for the people who will be watching this program to make sure that y'all hit the like button and that y'all subscribe to the channel so that y'all can get the notices when we have uh, these deep interviews. But uh, as I was saying before you went out, um, the, the book that I'm working on uh, Ma Chiluba Maweja, Yoruba Orisha, and Ancient Egyptian Ak, an exploratory etymological study. Uh, it, it, I build off of uh, part of the conversation that you have in here on the etymology of the word Orisha. And I'm right. showing how that word Orisha is all over Africa and the sound changes that make them sound different, but they are cognates uh, based yeah. on the regular sound meaning correspondences. Right. And so um, so your your work is definitely very, very much appreciated over yeah. here. And I try my best to promote uh, your text as, as much as possible. So, you know, this this interview allows um, people around the world to put a face to the name that I keep throwing out there that they need to read. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it is, it has been a, uh, a tremendous uh, joy to, to hear you and hopefully we can have you back and we can, yeah. you know, narrow down the conversation on a specific yeah. topic or something to that nature. Or yeah. if I get a hold of one of your works, we can, uh, one of your newer works, you know, we right. can dive deep into that. So I, I really can't wait to to mm -hmm. read that uh, mm -hmm. your your chart. Uh, the the uh, I forgot the title of the book. The uh, the origins um, was it the origins of Yoruba speech? The origins of Yoruba speech. Yeah. Uh, the, logistics, ballistics, and the trajectories of the human mind. Hmm. And you and we have semantic analogy. We have the babble of tongues, yeah. And uh, the comparative linguistics beyond Afroasiatic and Indo-European. Yeah. If I can find these, uh, I'm, I'm looking on the web. I can't find them anywhere, uh, but I'll you, keep. You, 
the information about it will reach you maybe in about, in about two days or okay yeah. all righty right. no i'm looking forward to reading your work i i, so, I sent you uh well i sent dr uh agdebola uh, a okay. pre-copy and, and so dr agdebola said he has already got it yeah i i sent it to him to, to, to oh, okay uh, I, I, will, I will read it avidly <laughs> and I will right. mark it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to your feedback. I look forward to your feedback. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, I, I won't hold you up uh, too much. Uh, we're going on um, two hours here, but if you have any last words, uh, some final thoughts that you that you want to say and you want people to know, um, the the floor is all yours. Right. Um, anybody working with human language, I want to give the following hints. One, no language is an island. Hmm. No language is an island. Whatever is your native language, know that it does not exist in isolation. Hmm. Therefore, listen to other languages you will come in contact with. That is one. Two, inside any single language, no word stands alone. Words are born in twins or triplets. If in English you find the word pin, P-I-N, look for pen. Can you get me? Look for P-I-N-E, pine. You have not left English language. Do the same to any language, your own language, and you'll see how the consonants are the bones. We do not rot fast in the grave, but the consonants like I, E in pin, E in pen, I, E in pine are the vowels in any word in any language in the world, you will find a lot of kicks and enjoyment for yourself. It's an endless process of search. Yeah, all that human beings have ever thought about will be crowding in upon you. Thank mm. you. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, I, I appreciate you greatly. And um, again, thank Dr. Uh, uh, Tunde Agdebola. Mm -hmm, yeah for for helping um put this together and uh, we'll be scheduling an interview with uh dr uh tunde agdebola in the in the near future and so he's a very important um person to know uh also coming out of yeah, nigeria yeah. and so you know right. uh on, on this channel i try to bring you know the the best of our minds um, so that, you know, uh, we can promote their works and expand on them and internalize what what they write, what they put together so that we can enhance our lives. And so um, you have greatly in, enhanced uh, my life and my work and my perspective and even in how I, I look at the stories. And uh, a lot of what you talk about, you even unknowingly have reaffirmed even in this conversation and um and so it is it's very important for us especially in the diaspora who did not have the privilege of growing up speaking our native languages you know in an in an, in an african environment you know we have some africanisms that we still maintain but it's, it's nothing like speaking the native language and then thinking in an African way. And, and when, when you're able to think in an African way, you're able to solve some of those historical mysteries like the, the cultures of ancient Egypt and Sumerian in the biblical text, because now you have the linguistic keys and, and that's what you have uh, given me and and i hope you know others who who will be introduced to your work um that that they will understand the importance 
of that language. Ooh, I'll ask one last question before we go. There, there has been a lot of conversation on the origins of the Yoruba. And some argue that they come, or at least a group have come out of ancient Egypt or the Sudan. Do you adhere to that argument or what is your opinion? Uh-huh. Now, uh, two types of information I want to give. All righty. One, the word Yoruba is not a Yoruba word. <laughs> right? One, right. Um, the same people who called the Yorubas Yoruba called Europe Yoruba today. Hmm. Yoruba. That is, the word Europe is not a European word. <laughs> Are you getting me? Yes. People in the Middle East looked towards sunset and southwest. They found some people, they called them Yoruba. Northwest, they found some people and called them Europa. Mm -hmm. Right east, right west along the Mediterranean, they found another group of people. They called them by this root, beginning with Ma, and they said Maghreb. Hmm. The Arab is in Erebus, land of the dead, where the sun sets every evening. In Hebrew, it is Arab, evening. Ma'arav hmm. is towards the sunset. So the same people who named Europe named the Yoruba, named the Maghribians of uh, Tunis and the Morocco and so on as Western people. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the Yorubas below, are kin to some West African coastal peoples like the Igbo, like the Akan, like the Shekiri and so on. So anybody who wants to find whether the Yorubas came from Sudan, for instance, must never say it is only the Yorubas. No. Whatever it is that the push and pull of migration affects many families together, many ethnic groups together. I give you for one group of Yoruba people, one group, hmm. the group called Ijebu. What I'm showing Kas Father is Ijebu. I am Ijebu. Now, that name Ijebu, inside Nigeria here, we Ijebus, of, we coastal Ijebus, don't monopolize it. When we begin to go north, we find Ijebu Ijesha. We go not a little bit, we find Ijebu or war. You say, ah, immediately without leaving Nigeria, you know that this word Y, J, B, indicates already migration. So you begin to ask yourself, is the migration from south to north, from, uh, that is from Ijebu Remo, Ijebu Ode, Ijebu Bo in the south near the uh, lagoon, to Ijebu Jesha, to Ijebu or war, or the other way around? And I tell myself, okay, two hypotheses. The Jabu coastal met water, lagoon, Atlantic. They have to change their lifestyle to go further. That type of place is called land's end, end of the land. Now, there is in this area a town called Ikosi. KS in Ikosi is what you find in Zulu in South Africa, Nkosi, harvest. Harvest is the end of the planting season. Ikosi is land's end. 
Hmm. Libro. Kits. Q. Kits. Kits are arrests. End of the land. So I said, these people are coming from the north and they reached land's end and named it Ecosi. So, um, so I said, I'm going to pursue it. Where in the north? JB, Jebu. On the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile was a Jewish settlement called Yeb. Y E B. Y E B. It was set up by the Jews to guard the southernmost point in the territory of the Persian Empire. In gratitude for the fact that Cyrus, the Persian king, freed them from Babylonian captivity. So they said, We'll guard the southernmost point of your empire for you. Y E B, Yeb. The Portuguese, when they were coming to West Africa, called the Jabu people, Jabu, Jabu, hmm. Y, J. Now, Alexander came, Alexander the Great, defeated Cyrus, disbanded Yeb. Hmm. Some people from Yeb, who are Hebrews, went up the Blue Nile, one of the tributaries, and got to Lake Tana, giving rise to the Falashas. Hmm. I have been on Lake Tana in Ethiopia, where the Falashas, before Jesus was born, and there were Jews in Africa. Some other one ran south along the White Nile, and they would get to Lake Victoria. Uh, uh, sorry, I said Lake Victoria. <laughs> That's one of the problems. That is in Yaza. We called it in Yaza. And you need to compare Yaza with the longest river in, in Asia. Nyanse. Nyanse. Nyaza. Hmm. If we did not recover our word in Yasa for Lake Victoria, we think that Queen Victoria is more important than the native name in Yaza. Anyway, some now went down to Ijebuowo, Ijebu Jesha, Ijebu Bo, Ijebu Ode, Ijebu Remo, until they got to lands and in Eco Rodu, K R D. I'm currently now going investigating whether there is a connection between Eco Rodu in southern Yoruba land and Takoradi, the seaport in Ghana. These are all what I'm investigating through studying the consonants and the consonantal families and the geographical environment and a bit of the history I know hmm. to see whether people don't carry their old ancient name with them wherever they went. That's how we got New England. <laughs> yeah. And I'm studying old world names in the new world, even in America, at the broadest hmm. world, uh, the, 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 Cambridge University, Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Huh? Los Angeles. What are Angeles? <laughs> uh, Las Vegas. What is Vegas? You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, because the words are not millions. The words are tied around our neck when we migrate. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to the new place and say New Orleans. New yeah. Orleans. New this. New York. Nueva York. Nova Scotia, bringing all the old names. That's how we brought all the old names from the Middle East. Why Middle East? Exactly. The, the rivers. Mm. Uh, what is it? Nile. Yeah. Tigris and Euphrates. Take 
Euphrates, cut out the EU, which Greek supplied as good, good okay. fratis. In the Bible, it's frat, frat, that frat, hmm. R-T, R-T. In South Africa, it's umfolozi, hmm. umfolozi. In England, it's floss, F-L-O-S-S, -S, the mill by the floss. In hmm. Ghana, it is VLT, Volta. Are you getting me? Yeah. These are the rivers that flowed out of Eden. One of them, Gihon. Yes. Beloved in the, by the Ethiopians because it flows south to the land of Sheba and all that sort of thing. You get to Abekuta, you find the river. That's our own Gihon here. Yeah. Hmm. So these are. <clears throat> the brothers fight each other, by the way. Hmm. Just because we have one language doesn't mean we are not going to fight each other. <laughs> Ken and yeah. Abel were said to be brothers. And there is what they call, what is this called? Um, sibling. Sibling rivalry. Yeah. yeah. Look at her. Look, can you imagine Jacob deceiving his brother twin? Hmm. Well, let's look at our families and see such phenomena. But also, let us learn to build a Philadelphia. America had to build a Philadelphia. Otherwise, the Americans would kill, the, kill, kill themselves off. <laughs> yeah, Philadelphia, brotherly love, everywhere in the world, and build it solidly in that style of architecture which you have on the Parthenon. You can find such a building in the battle where I live on top of Mapo Hill. It was brought here by the British, but solid mm. foundation everywhere in the world. Mm. And people fighting against xenophobia. There is no time today to tell you that G Z N G Z N N is G she N in the land of Goshen. Hmm. Yes, the land of Goshen is the land of aliens. Every country must provide a land for aliens because you yourself are aliens. Yes, who dropped from heaven? <laughs> yeah, nobody. If anybody say I am Native American. We came in 1700 and something. You say 1700 and something. What is 1700 and something? <laughs> you came first and then you, you begin to shut the door against new new migrants. You are starting to fail. <laughs> you are starting to fail. I repeat it. You are starting to fail. Because you got the land from those who welcomed you. If they killed you on the shore when you first came in a single boat, what is that boat called? Mayflower. <laughs> yeah. If you had massacred everybody on the Mayflower, the history would be different. They welcome them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's where we are. Well, um, again, I appreciate uh, you coming um, and, and joining us today. Uh, I think it's what after five o'clock in Nigeria. Uh, right now um so it's it's just just becoming afternoon here uh, after 12 uh, on the east coast of the united states and um i i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and i uh, love learning from you and so um i'll definitely be in touch and hopefully we can get you back again um again we'll be um setting up an interview with dr uh, uh, Tunde Adibola, uh, very soon. So, um, and in the major work that he's doing, you know, out there in Nigeria as well. And y'all need to get to know uh, who he is. So, with that yeah. said, uh, thank you uh, again uh, thank you. Thank for, you. for for the interview. And for those of you thank who you. are are listening, again, leave a comment um like 
the show and make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you can get uh, further updates of these upcoming uh, interviews and conversations that we're having. So with that said, uh, God bless y'all. Good night. Hotep. Peace. How we say uh, here. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.